Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, combined Center for Innovation and Clean Energy and Fortis BC webinar about our upcoming call for proposals to deal with the forestry residue management issue. We'll just get started in a second. We still have people coming in, and it looks like there's a backlog of, of entrants to get into the, uh, the web chat here. Okay, so let's get started. My name is Jed McLean. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Innovation and Clean Energy. I will be joined in a moment by Mark Warren, who's the Director of Business Innovation for Fortis BC, right on cue. Hi, Mark. And Ashley Callister, who is the CICE Venture Associate, who is leading this call and will be the primary uh, point of contact taking this thing forward. Next slide, please. I'd like to begin by acknowledging with, with great appreciation that we're operating on traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the First Nations, the Inuit and Métis people. And we're aware that people are dialing into this call or connecting to this call from all over the province and possibly the country. And I just ask you to think about the local situation in which you are in and the local nations that you are um, working with in your work. Um, we appreciate that. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about our call for innovation on forest residues. Uh, this uh, will encompass a brief introduction to the Center for Innovation and Clean Energy, a brief introduction to the Fortis BC's Clean Growth Innovation Fund, and then we'll dig into, into this. The purpose of the webinar is to provide a framing for the call that we're issuing, and then to offer an opportunity for you to answer, uh, for us to answer questions about everything from the scope of projects to the mechanics of how you apply. So this is intended to be a, a, a time for you to learn and then for you to ask questions. We are recording this session and this session will be made available on our website so that others can access it. Uh, and there will be um, time for question and answer at the end. We, we think we've got some major questions that we'll sort of answer in a canned fashion and then we will be um, opening things up. And there is an email address which is dedicated to this call. Uh, we are accessible. So if you have questions that arise, even if we don't get to them on today's webinar call, uh, we certainly will attempt to answer every question that is put to us about uh, what we're doing. What we want to do is incentivize the best possible field of applications so that we have the best possible solutions coming forward uh, that might begin to address this issue. So the next slide, please. Before we dive in, we'd like to do a quick poll. We'd like to know where everybody's coming from. So if we could uh, just throw the poll up and please please vote. Where about are you? I'm gonna just give a couple of, couple of seconds here for people to click on one of these options, please. I think this is where we're supposed to cue some music that, uh, you know, Ding, 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 something like that. But we don't have that today. Now, this is terrific um, to see these results. And in particular, to see the participation from outside the lower mainland. I think that's great. And we are really hoping that we can get awareness of this call, you know, well beyond the, the more urban uh, reaches that an organization like ours might, might be considered to have. So I'm encouraged to see this response and hopefully we can amplify this message further. Okay, so let's dig into it uh, if we can. And um, next slide. So the Center for Innovation and Clean Energy, for those who don't know, we're an independent not-for-profit organization. We set our own agenda for what we do. We um, are formed by the province of British Columbia, Shell Canada, and Natural Resources Canada, which is the federal government of Canada. But despite having those government and large corporate backers, uh, we are independent. And our, our mandate is to see what we can do to accelerate the world toward net zero efficiently, effectively, by 
promoting and supporting innovation from British Columbia to the world. Um, I'm really excited today that uh, the last bullet on this slide talks about new member partnerships to unleash new decarbonization possibilities. And today uh, we're trying something out, and that is a partnership between uh, Fortis BC and CICE. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, which we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. CICE works in four areas. We're about clean energy, and our four focus areas are low carbon bio and synthetic fuels. So in a sense, this call is being done under the auspices of that focus area. Um, the forest residue is a biomass, which is has massive amounts of energy potential, as well as climate uh, long-term climate implications. We work in battery and energy storage. We work in carbon management, and this call also impinges on the carbon management question, particularly with the wildfire issues that are increasingly impacting the emissions. And then low carbon hydrogen is the other area that we work on. And the logos there are the companies that we funded to date uh, with our contributions. Next slide, please. What we do in CICE, we, we do have open calls where we just ask people what, you know, what great ideas and innovations are you working on? And then we've been able to fund those. And most of the companies in that last slide were funded under that uh, mechanism. But what we're moving toward, and this is our first call uh, related to this more structured process, we dig deep into trying to understand what is needed. What, what are the problems that really could do with some innovative thought in order to change the status quo in order to move us to a decarbonized future? We consult then with stakeholders and with industry leaders, with academics, communities, we, government. We consult broadly as we start to form a, a thesis about, huh, these, these would be a really interesting area for us to, to try and stimulate some innovation in. And then we define a call and then we move into uh, a more normal application process where we receive and evaluate proposals and award funding. So in the context of this sequence, we are right in the middle. We've defined our call, and we're now with this webinar, we're kicking off the process where we're communicating to any innovator uh, what our intention to support is, and then we'll move into a process, and Ashley will describe the, the formal process later on in this webinar. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned today, uh, our potential is exponential. We, um, because of the uh, low carbon fuel emphasis and renewable natural gas, we have talked extensively over the last 18 months with Fortis BC. Fortis has their own innovation fund, which is independent of CICE. And we began to realize that our objectives were aligned and that this problem of residue management was something that we were both intensely interested in trying to see if there's a way that we can stimulate some change. So we've come together with an agreement uh, to work on the promotion, the alignment, um, uh, the mechanism for application so that we have one, one place to go. Ultimately, CICE and Fortis will fund independently of each other, but in agreement with each other. We'll work out this, but uh, it'll be independent funding from the two of us. And by doing this, we've been able to create a mechanism where we can go quite quickly we haven't had to form a new partnership that's formal and legal. We're, we're just aligned and we want to go fast together. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Warren, who we've been working with now for a while um, on, this, on this wonderful idea. So Mark, over to you. And then once Mark is, is finished introducing the Clean Growth Innovation Fund, we'll get into the details of the call. Thanks a lot, Jed, and uh, and hello, and good morning to everybody, and good afternoon, perhaps, in some cases as well. Uh, I am Mark Warren. I'm the Director of Business Innovation at Fortis BC, and one of the most exciting things that I that I do here is, uh, is manage our Clean Growth Innovation Fund. So by way of introduction to Fortis BC, I think many of you may be aware that we are the primary natural gas distributor in British Columbia. We serve just over a million uh, gas customers, but we're also a vertically integrated electric utility serving about 150,000 customers in the south central part of the province. And I'm joining you today from the unceded traditional territory of the Okanagan peoples and uh, in a place we now call Kelowna, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that. 
Um, Fortis BC in turn is owned by Fortis Inc., uh, which is a publicly traded company, both uh, TSE and NYSE, based in St. John's. And Fortis Inc. owns 10 utilities in, uh, in US, Canada, and the Caribbean. We all of the utilities, all of the Fortis utilities are committed to reducing our carbon footprint in accordance with our specific operating and environment. And in the case of BC, our customers and our government have a very strong commitment to reducing carbon emissions, as do we. And one of the things this has resulted in, of course, is the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030 plan. And uh, and and we are uh, very interested in feeding in, into that. And we've been doing so for nearly a decade. We've been investing in uh, renewable natural gas, uh, aka biomethane, for almost a decade and offering it to our customers in varying percentages of their choosing. Um, and uh, as of today, we have contracts in place for that represent nearly 10% of our total gas supply, which um, uh, which would all be online and operating by 2027. But despite these early successes, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of work to be done in advancing gas related decarbonization. And, and to that end, we filed for the creation of the Clean Growth Innovation Fund a few years ago. And you can see what the, the, uh, the initial goals were that this slide came right from our initial application to the Utilities Commission here in the province. And so it was approved and it's funded by our customers uh, through a small charge on every bill that goes out. And, and that's created a $25 million fund for advancing the kind of innovations we're talking about today. It's still, this is quite unique among uh, North American utilities um, in that it allows us broad discretion to invest in, in, in technologies that pave the way to, uh, to, to the decarbonization. Next slide, please. So, uh, as Jed mentioned, um, the the our, our interests, as it turned out over these discussions over the last few years, have been very uh, very aligned. And so, it, this 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 uh, this call today just makes a lot of sense. So, I've I've already mentioned biomethane, and so we're looking at expanding feedstock uh, uh, as much as we can, as well as increasing production at existing facilities. We're very interested in low carbon intensity hydrogen and syngas. We're doing research with uh, with academic institutions in the province on uh, on on blending of hydrogen into the natural gas system, but also looking forward to the future where we may move to a very uh, a, a hydrogen only type distribution system. And so, looking at the various end uses for that, and of course, uh, carbon capture is of of interest to us. So, it's a lot of alignment between what you see with CICE and their interests, and and the Fortis BC interests as well. That's it for me and the intro to F Fortis BC. Great. So, Ashley, uh, if you can take us through some of the details of this call, over to you, and then we can enter a Q and A period. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jed, and thanks, Mark, for those introductions. So hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Callister. I lead the Low Carbon Bio and Synthetic Fuels portfolio here at CICE. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how this call for innovation came to be and then expand on the opportunity and get into the specifics of the call itself. So as was mentioned, uh, while conducting quite a bit of the intelligence work and broad stakeholder consultation within the Low Carbon Fuels Focus Area, an issue that kept coming up again and again on the feedstock side was really how do we unlock the forest residues within the province here? And this really is a localized challenge with two main pathways contributing to emissions and as well the accumulation of wood fiber here in BC. And with wildfire season upon us, we know that the looming threat of fires and associated emissions is very sobering. And we've included a brief trivia poll question just to give everyone a sense of what the uh, the actual emissions are. So during the high fire years, how many emissions CO2 tons from wildfires in BC were emitted? What do people think? And again, we do need some, some music in the background here, but I'm not going to sing as Jeff did. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, so as most of you are aware, it is a very high emission profile, and it is actually 150 to 200 million tons per year of those high fire years across the province, which really brings to the forefront the need to increase resilience within our forestry sector here in BC. And with wildfire prevention, we know the, the province is mobilizing to mitigate wildfires, and with this often comes thinning, um, which actually further increases fiber in BC's forests. Not that it's easy to access, but it's, it's along with and separate from the slash that is produced from other forestry activity. And regarding slash, we know that approximately 24 green metric tons of slash fiber is produced per hectare of logging activity in the province. So if we think about 190,000 hectares per year of logging activity in BC, that translates to approximately 4.6 green metric tons of slash produced, which is commonly most stacked and burned on site. 4.6 million green metric tons is a very massive number and that doesn't account for the thinning as well. So as we know, this is also increasing emissions and then also eliminating other utilization opportunities. And why is it being burned? Well, through our broad consultation, our understanding is that in a lot of cases, this fiber is hard to identify. It's really hard to access due to remote locations or other factors. Commercial incentivization of the collection, transport, and processing of these residues has proven challenging due to low economic value of the residues themselves, as well as difficult terrain, long transportation distances, et cetera. And ultimately, this is translated into an uneconomic and underutilized resource. But as we say, every challenge is just an opportunity in disguise. So what is the opportunity here? Well, we know that what we've been doing isn't working, and we know that the province is committed to eliminating slash piles by 2030, which is fantastic. But how do we get there? Well, we become, we believe that it, it originates from a real shift in mindset. And with that in mind, I'm gonna pose a few questions that we've been thinking about that we hope that the attendees on this call are thinking about as well. And those are, how do we best identify and access this fiber? And instead of saying the economics don't make sense, therefore this process or project is unapproachable, how do we change the narratives around the economics to really incentivize collection and transport? And are we actually aware of all of the commercialization pathways for conversion technologies, as well as end uses for these residues? And how might developing, developing diversifying these really impact the market and demand side of this issue? And as was mentioned earlier, what role does carbon management play in this space and in these solutions? And when we think about the scale, often we're approaching this from a very top-down perspective of a large scale solution, and sometimes that's discouraging, but how can we rethink the scale of these solutions to potentially incorporate a more regional model that could have benefits in a new way in the province? And really, how do we empower our local indigenous stakeholders and remote communities here in BC? So a lot of questions to think about, but one thing is clear, it's together in considering these questions, there's a lot that we can do. And it's not a one size fits all solution. It can't be solved by just changing forestry practices alone. So what are we going to do? Well, I'll reiterate that CICE and CGIF were not government, and we are inspired by the innovation we've seen in some of the policy that's surrounding the province, but our specific mandate is really accelerating commercial technologies and business model innovations. So how are we taking action? Well, we are mobilizing our network so that we're, we're expanding opportunity through this call for innovation, and we know that we're not the first to consider this issue but our bias for speed, our unique funding model, and the fact that over 200 of you registered for this webinar today, give us hope that together we can really contribute to the solution here. So with that, let's move into some specific questions that have come through the email. Um, we do have a specific email set up for this call for innovation and talk a little bit more about the process and the eligibility requirements for this opportunity. So question one, we get this a lot, what makes a quote unquote good project? And I'll say that there are many definitions of a good project that could be considered through this call, but based on the priorities of the program and the priorities of both of the funding organizations, um, we will be prioritizing a scalable innovation 
with the greatest impact on decarbonization and looking at solutions preferably between TRL or technology readiness level four to nine that encompasses both the CGIF and CICE mandate. But ultimately, a good project doesn't just focus on the technology or a single source of impact. It really encompasses ESG or economic impact in addition. So these co-benefits of a project. And if we think about question two, where people are asking what types of solutions are eligible for this project. It's actually quite a wide range and we've left it open intentionally because as was mentioned through both the framing and the consideration of questions for this call, it's clear that the issue isn't in one spot on this value chain, it's really kind of linking the supply chain together. So commercially viable pathways for collection, transportation, and management of the forestry residue will all be considered and including opportunities for slash and thinning byproducts to reduce wildfire risks. We'll also be considering diversification of utilization solutions to derive energy value from forestry residue. So this is on the solid liquid and gaseous side of the energy side of things. And then we'll also be looking at proposals that align forest management with carbon management innovations. So nature-based solutions, bioenergy with carbon capture utilization and storage, and other potentially negative emission technologies that really take into account the carbon picture that is associated with forestry management in BC. And question three, of course, top of mind, describe the application process and key dates. So as you know, the scoping stage has been going on for quite some time now, but we're looking forward to actually opening our doors for applications on June 26th, so just next week, with a virtual application through a video EOI. And while some of you might cringe that you have to submit a video to us, we've actually done this intentionally to keep things simple and make it as accessible as possible. And we promise we're not going to judge you on your video quality or your production value. So please don't feel like you have to submit uh, a work of art to us. Really, it could just be you sitting in front of your computer, holding up your phone, speaking about what you plan to tackle in your innovation and through your project. And we will be posting an application guide on our website. Um, I believe it's actually already there and available. And it outlines the questions that need to be addressed in the video. But really, we know that in Vancouver and some of the other metropolitan areas, people get really used to writing these grants. Um, we want to push them out of their comfort zones a little bit. And then we also want to make it easy for the other aspects of the province that might not be used to this method of application. So again, trying to innovate in the way we're even looking at innovations, but make it as accessible as possible. And this stage will be open until August 18th. So we're giving it eight weeks and we really invite you to amplify this opportunity. So if you have contacts in the more remote regions of the province, please let them know it's a very simple process and we would love to hear from them and then from there we'll review the videos um, it's a very short little written EOI as well just summary of the company name contact etc and assess the alignment with our mandates and some of the organizations companies that apply will be invited to submit a detailed proposal based on alignment with either program and these will be um, notified on August 25th and then given three weeks to submit these detailed proposals. And we will work closely with the innovators that make it to this stage. Um, we definitely want it to be an inclusive process. And from there, we'll be conducting quite stringent due diligence on climate, finance, legal, the typical aspects that need to be considered in a successful project before moving into a contribution agreement stage, um, which likely will occur with either CGIF or CICE as noted earlier. Uh, but CICE will be the primary lead on taking everyone through the process just to make things easy on the innovator side and keep things consistent. And if there's any other questions about this, of course, please send us an email. We're really happy to take you through, but most of it's summarized in our application guide, which will be on the website. So the fourth question is, what is the maximum amount of funding per project? So as was stated, there is up to $6 million available through this opportunity. Um, there is no limitation on the amount of funding that innovators are able to request. So you could ask for $6 million, but please keep in mind that if you're asking for $6 million, you're asking us to fund only one project through this entire call for innovation. 
And as we can see, there's a wide array of interest as well as potential solutions that could be supported to really further this, uh, this issue. So smaller requests will be prioritized in order to uh, accommodate multiple solutions. So we just ask you to consider that as you're uh, thinking about the requirements for your specific project and making the ask to CICE. But between the two of us, we do intend to fund several projects of different sizes for a total up to $6 million. When can the funding be used? Well, as was seen on that little diagram, the contribution agreements for awarded projects will be put in place by October 27th, 2023. So again, this kind of demonstrates our bias for action. We are moving very quickly. We're looking to fund projects this year, October 27th. And as a requirement to kind of further this bias, the projects must start within six months of signing a contribution agreement. And while we're aware that there are a lot of great opportunities out there that might be a little bit longer term, we will be prioritizing the projects that really have a near term impact on the requirements that we're looking for. And the funding schedule will be specific to the project and aligned with the project spending and completion of predetermined milestones. So this will be present in the more detailed aspect of the proposal. But we do ask as you're submitting your ideas to us that you're thinking about the long-term funding schedule and that it aligns with this real make a difference, make it quickly mindset that we're operating within. And question six, how can the funding be used? So broadly, the funding can be used for any aspect that directly relates to your project. So salaries, consultants, project management um, on the demonstration side, maybe sites, operating costs, pilot production, prototypes, as it says here, integrating system components, manufacturing, et cetera. But um, anything that is a direct fit within the project, so even some directly related capital costs could be considered, but anything that is completely external to the project, which moves us into question seven of what is outside funding of scope, will not be considered. So day-to-day -day business operations, unrelated purchase capital equipment, leasehold improvements, for example, furniture equipment for routine business. So we're not gonna pay for your new corporate vehicle, et cetera. Um, advertising, forms of business promotion, or any sort of additional human resource or overhead. And this is pretty standard, but we just wanna reiterate this so that as again, you're thinking of your application, um, you're being realistic in what you're asking us to support, knowing what our priorities are here. And again, on the funding side, we've been asked, what are the rules on stacking limits and leveraging funds from other programs? So the great news here is that both CICE and CGIF funding can be stacked with funds from other programs and leveraged to obtain additional funding. And really this is what we're after actually, is we're hoping to de-risk this project. We're hoping to empower innovators to secure funding from additional sources. So we're not limiting any sort of stacking with our funding. We're really hoping to move these solutions forward at a large scale. That being said, projects with strong co-funding and commercial support will be prioritized. So you'll see through the EOI that there is an option to tell us about the partnerships that are in place. And we'll be excited to learn who else you're talking to in the space. For the ninth question, can organizations have more than one project funded with CICE or CGIF? Again, great news, the answer is yes. So one organization can apply for different projects or have multiple funded projects under both CICE or CGIF programs. So if you've already applied to us, we'd love to hear from you again. If you've got something in the pipeline with either of us, tell us more about what you're doing within the company. We understand that we don't want to put limitations on companies. We don't want anyone to be a one hit wonder. So please come back to us. We both want to be an avenue of support as you continue to develop. And question 10, this is kind of the last question that came through the pipeline multiple times, are what are the main differences between CICE and CGIF's priorities? So we know that this is kind of a new way of doing funding where we have these two separate funds coming together to consider a single stream of applicants, which is very exciting um, in, in the way that it actually opens the door to a little bit of a larger scope than would be considered between just one or just the other fund. And with that in mind, um, from a CICE perspective, we'll be prioritizing BC-based innovators um, or projects that are located here in BC with scalable BC-developed IP. Um, we will not be prioritizing feasibility studies, feed studies, or academic consortia, and that just goes back to our mandate 
whereas the CGIF, for instance, it's not mandatory that you are BC based. Um, they will be considering applications from Canada as well as potentially international based organizations, so long as the technology or the solution that is developed does have applicability here in BC and could be furthered here in the province. Um, they'll also be considering potentially feasibility studies, feed studies, so long as it aligns with the mandate of this opportunity and academic-led applications. So I'll open the door now to any other questions that are coming through. So Stacy, was there anything that came up? I can see the chat kind of pinging, so I have a feeling it's <laughs> not silent. Um, yes. But between the three of us, Mark, Jed, and I will do our best to answer any unlocked questions. Fantastic and great presentation. Thanks, Ash. Yeah, um, and thank you to all of you for taking time out today to participate. Your questions are amazing, and we're trying to get to as many of them as we can. The ones that we do not answer during this session, we will definitely be reaching out to you directly, and we will ensure that there's answers um, to everyone's questions at the end of the day. Uh, the first one that came in, can you speak about the approach to co-funding in the final stage? And um, I think this is pertaining to contracting. Uh, Mark, maybe you can start us off with an answer for that. Yeah, so the, the intent here is to simplify the application process as, as much as possible. And so the two stages that um, Ashley referred to earlier, the EOI stage and then the more detailed proposal stage will be a single process. So thank goodness for that. And thank you to CICE for taking all that on. If uh, if a, a, an applicant is successful in, in uh, being approved for funding, then you might be signing a CA with CGIF. You might be signing one with um, CICE. Or if you're really lucky, you could be signing a contribution agreement with both of us. And so that's the, la the last step is where you might end up with two parallel processes. But for most, for most of the way through, it's going to be a single process. Okay. Thank you. Um, what scale of solutions are prioritized through this call? Ashley, do you want to take that one? Sure, yeah. Um, so in terms of the scale, I alluded to this earlier in, in how we're thinking about diversifying our approach. So we're really looking at regional solutions that could have replicability across different areas of the province. So these are a little bit maybe smaller scale solutions. We understand that <laughs> not everything in this space is going to be a high tech software solution. It could be something um, simple boots on the ground that could have impact in multiple different areas. But that being said, we're open to solutions of all shapes and sizes. Um, we'll be considering both the smaller scale and the larger scale solutions so long as it fits within either of our and both of our mandates. Um, because really it does take innovation and innovators of all different backgrounds to really make a difference on this path. So hopefully that answers the question. Jed, would you like to add something? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I wonder how you figured that out, uh, Stacy. Yeah, so, you know, we are looking for innovative solutions and we do not have a preconception as to what projects we're hoping to fund. And I must emphasize that what we're trying to do is make the make the initial application process as simple as possible so that we can see the full span of ideas that are coming forward and being proposed. So if you're wondering whether your project is a good fit or not, you can talk to us about that and we can have a chat or you can take a flyer and for the price of producing a five minute video and, and ticking a few boxes on a form, if you've got a real project, I mean, we're not asking people to just kind of blue sky make stuff up, but if you've got a real project, we want to know about it because um, if we can't be flexible and think about what, what's implied by your project, which might be really ground, groundbreaking in some way, we don't want to create constraints that would stop you from being able to advance that idea and make us aware of it. Um, we really want to find ways to encourage ideas, encourage the pool of ideas to be as strong as possible. So if in doubt, apply and uh, just don't get your hopes up too much, right? Because we have a lot of, a lot of um, interest in the call and only limited funds. Great. Um, there was a question and this was directed towards Florida SBC. And I think what we're looking for is some um, 
knowledge on the practical action plan to engage universities and colleges. This question is more or less um, being asked by somebody that is not in the lower mainland. Is that something or, or would um, applications from these universities be um, accepted as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, what we have done um, uh, and uh, we uh, and we have worked with uh, uh, universities and uh, and academic institutions outside of the lower mainland in the past. Um, the, the, my only advice to academic institutions is we did we do tend to be focused on TRL and hopefully hopefully everybody's familiar with technology readiness levels, but TRL levels of four to four to nine in that range or four to seven. So it tends to be uh, projects that the universities are looking toward commercialization for, not just pure research. Jed, would you like to add something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> just to emphasize that, you know, CICE doesn't fund research, as Mark has said, but we uh, are very pleased to, to work with early stage companies at the seed stage because the, you know, we want to help companies move. It's all about moving from the lab into commercialization. So that's the sweet spot for CICE, where we really hope that we can incentivize some great ideas and help them really move forward in the path to becoming, you know, going concern commercial entities that are addressing this problem on a daily basis through their actions. Um, so we don't fund universities, but we get darn close. Um, what is the duration of funding? Who would like to take that? Jack, I'll take that. Uh, yeah, we, we fund a contribution agreement. So the process is you tell us your idea in, in a lightweight form. If you're successful, then the prize is, then you get to put a lot of work into an application that lays out in detail what your project is, where both organizations are funding projects. You're not just going to get a check. You're going to work with us to define a project. If that's a two month project and the result is, is concluded, great. If that's a two year project and it makes sense that it's a two year project, then we'll define milestones, we'll define a contribution agreement and we'll work with you for those two years. It's, a, it's not a one size fits all uh, process. It's a project by project process of defining together, co-developing a contribution agreement, right. which we'll hold you to, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> And there's yeah. a few questions about um, leveraging other funding programs. And I know, Ashley, you did touch on this, but maybe we should just clarify one more time. Um, the questions are along the lines of, can this funding be leveraged with other funding programs? Um, are there limits on percentages of project costs or limits when stacking with other grants? Yeah, happy to, to uh, reemphasize that we have no limitations on stacking with other funds. Um, that's on our side, so I can't speak for the other funds that you're looking at. Uh, I would check with their specific requirements, but from either of our funds, there are no limitations. In terms of how much we would be willing to contribute to a project in terms of a percentage, we at CICE, and Mark, you can correct me if there's a difference with CGIF, we, we actually don't have a limit there either. But we would uh, emphasize that we're hoping that the innovators submitting solutions would also have some skin in the game, so to speak, for, uh, for their proposals. So while we will fund up to 100% of total project costs, we would prefer not to. Um, again, it gets back to our limited funding and the wide range of solutions. We would prefer that innovators do have some percentage of contribution to their project, ideally up to 40 to 50%, but not necessarily so that we're able to accommodate multiple solutions through this opportunity. And Jed and Mark, feel free to. So from a CGIF perspective, we do require co-funding. Uh, we'd like to see the applicant have some skin in the game, as, as Ashley said, but, um, but it, uh, it, it, we do need co-funding of some sort for CGIF. Yeah. The, uh, the CICE perspective on that is that it, we recognize that we think there may be some local um, circular economy type ideas coming forward for this project. And we, we don't want to make a hard limit. We really want matching funding, okay? And let's just make no bones about it, that, that that's the ideal. But we also don't want to create barriers to a fantastic idea by having a hard rule there. So 
for smaller communities or, or new ideas that are coming forward for people who don't have access to the big venture capital stream, et cetera. Um, we, we wanna be open to the possibility. So that's why we don't have a funding requirement, but at the same time, um, don't think that that means that everything that we fund is just 100% CICE funded. We funded 23 projects, and I think on average, we have somewhere in excess of 50% matching from, from other sources, well in excess of that, actually. Okay, thanks, Jared. Um, there's another question here, and I think we're going to kickstart it with you as well. And it's um, there's actually been a couple of questions just about the defining of forestry residue and how broadly it's defined. Um, in this case here, it's can it include carbon positive projects that involve improved management of pulp mill or sawmill res residuals byproducts. Um, there's a few of these. So maybe just an overall statement about um, how wide and broad we are in terms of uh, projects what we're looking for would be a good place to start. Do you want to start, Jed? Sure, I can. I can ah, yeah. ah. So, so the intent here is the accumulation of residues that are left in the forest. So I have no question that the um, the residues at the mill are an issue and a, and a valuable source of, of energy that, that can be tapped. But for CICE's perspective, the emphasis here is on the stuff which is being left in the forest, which is very difficult to get out of the forest and to use economically, at least that's the, the conventional wisdom. And we're hoping that through this call, we'll have some, some ways of, of getting around that uh, sort of conventional um, narrative on this issue. So once again, um, you know, you're welcome to put a proposal in that talks about those residues, but you're getting very much on the fringe of what our focus is. Our focus is really on, first of all, you know, the historical issue of the accumulation of slash from forest operations, but through our consultations with industry, we begin to become very aware that this is actually a climate change adaptation issue because of the changes in forest practices that are coming in order to manage this growing wildfire issue that's gonna result in a lot of what looks kind of like slash um, residues that are thinning residues. So that's the focus, right? But as always, this is innovative call. So we try to create as few constraints as possible, but the focus is on what's in the forest that is really darn difficult to get out. Okay. And I did notice that we are coming up on time here. Let's get two more questions in. Um, and yes, there was one about, you know, for the questions that we don't answer, we intend to reach out to you directly and we will put together a doc that just has Q and A and has all the answers that I hope um, you all find interesting and we'll make sure that we send that out. Um, this one is, if an applicant has multiple ideas, should those be combined into one application or should they be separated? And Ashley, do you want to address that one? Sure, yeah. If the ideas are related, like if it's kind of establishing as was alluded to earlier, a circular economy or a supply chain, then by all means, please submit a single application. But if they're completely separate, I would recommend that you submit separate applications to highlight each of the opportunities. And again, we don't have restraints on how many applications are submitted per proponent. Um, please don't send us like 100 applications just from every idea that you have. But um, yeah, I would separate out the separate ideas. But if you're linking them together, then please send us one cohesive application. Great. And the last one, will CICE connect applications that have potential to work together? That's a really good question. <laughs> and who would uh, like to who would like to start that one? Maybe Mark, do you want to start with that, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, my inclination is yes to that. And uh, to be perfectly honest and blunt, we haven't really talked about this explicitly, but I think that um, that yes, that if if there was clear, you know, clearly two uh, two applications, you know, one that done just spitballing here that had an innovative idea, you know, for uh, bringing out residues uh, uh, in the forest or reducing them in some way uh, to to uh, uh, to make them easier to transport and that that product itself uh, could feed into a uh, into another downstream process. And, you know, that was an obvious connection. 
we'd try and make that. Uh, yeah. That's that's my initial response, but um, that won't. I don't. I don't think there'll be an overarching effort to do that. Uh, if I could just, uh, you know, move that on. So, I, Mark is right on in terms of building a system solution where we may see multiple components and we we see complementarity. Then it would feel right and correct for us to make that complementary opportunity known to the applicants. However, I do want to emphasize something else though, and that is that we respect the intellectual property of the applicants. And it's entirely possible that we will see competitive applications for similar ideas. And so we have a difficult road to hoe in the sense that uh, we want to encourage collaboration and cooperation, but I also wanna give applicants the assurance that we respect their autonomy and we would be, we, we're not going to be publishing on a, on a website, hey, here are the pool of ideas that we've received, because we recognize that if you're going to develop commercial solutions, you, you need something called a competitive advantage, right, in order to move that forward. So please understand that, yes, we want to broaden, we want to see system solutions, we want to encourage that. Where we see complementarity, we will try to find ways to, to bring that forward. But first and foremost, we respect the autonomy of the, uh, the groups applying and we respect their intellectual property and recognize the value of that. So um, within that balancing act, yeah, we'd like to get as much collaboration going as possible, but we don't want, we don't want to sort of muddy the waters by giving away people's IP. That's not our intent in any way, shape or form. Thanks, Chad. Okay, and with that, I think um, we're out of time, but there are a ton of other questions that have come in, and thank you again for your interest. As Ashley had mentioned, and Ash will let you close this out, um, I think we have one final poll question that we would love for you to answer. It's in regards to whether or not you're actually planning on applying, and with that, I'll launch that, and um, then we can end this call. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So as that's being launched, um, I would just like to extend my sincere gratitude to Mark at Fortis BC, as well as Jed, our executive director here for their comments on the call today, but especially to everyone who's tuned in. Um, it's amazing to see how much interest this opportunity has garnered, and we're so excited to receive your applications, to really, again, kind of expand this scope of thinking about a problem that's really been around for a long time to see if together we really can make an impact and, and move things forward. So I think we're feeling pretty optimistic based on the response that we've, we've gotten and ultimately just very inspired. And I'm hoping now that the poll question is coming in that we will be receiving applications and that it's not just going to be a... Uh, a straight no, but yeah, okay, this is fantastic to see that the majority of uh, participants on the call today will be planning to submit an application. And if you're unsure if potentially things are still unclear, then of course we invite you to get into contact with us. Please take a look at the application guide and the landing page on our website. And we do have a dedicated email um, associated with questions coming in from the call. So that is FRM 2023, so forestry residue management at CICE.ca. And please send us an email there. We'll do our best to respond to every question that comes through the gate. And with that, thank you so much for your time. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you and we hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you.